Welcome to On The Level, broadcasting from the Blue Ocean Network studios here in Beijing. My name is Fergus Thompson. Now, something very unusual is happening in Chinese movie theatres this week. A documentary film is getting a nationwide theatrical release. Now, this is not some sort of uh, patriotic government-sponsored uh, tearjerker or, or some worthy look at uh, an aspect of China's economic miracle. This documentary focuses on that uh, ubiquitous element of 21st century television, the TV reality contest. In this case, one called Superboy, something of a, a Chinese version of Miracle Idol on uh, Hunan television and the name of the documentary is uh, I am myself the director is Fan Li Xin and he's my guest on on the level this week uh, Li Xin thanks for joining us thanks for having me now as I said this this release is happening at the moment I believe it was actually uh, postponed by a few days because it was going to clash with a, a very successful commercial film called uh, uh, Tiny Times I, is that good or, or bad for you and for the film well uh I guess it's very difficult to use the simple word good or bad to describe the uh, postponement of this film. Mm -hmm. uh, for us to, to make this documentary cinema film to be put on a cinema, have a national wide release, is already quite a huge thing for us. Sure. Uh, I would love to call it sort of a, a success already to, yeah. you know, kind of. Uh, having it on this big screen side by side with such a huge commercial film which all the young people would be going to the tiny times but we know the documentary cinema market mm -hmm. is pretty much non-existent in, in, in today's Chinese right. film industry uh, the film market but this is a Chinese story and uh, although it's uh, it's sort of the backstage story of a very popular talent show in China. Still, it's a documentary, and the the very concept of documentary cinema is uh, it's still quite new to the to the audience. So right. We should point out, I think, here that it is really very unusual that a documentary film, even a feature-length documentary film, gets a, a nationwide release here. The, the public are not used to going to see documentary films. No, right? they're not. Uh, I mean, for documentaries, uh, I think in the past 20 years, uh, the Chinese audience has seen more documentaries on television. So uh, I guess they, they have a sort of Im impression that documentary is television. Mm -hmm. And though we know that there's documentary cinema and feature docs, um, but when, when you're watching like 30 years of uh, very much propagandized uh, feature reports and mm -hmm. you think that's documentary film it's very hard to to change your concept or change your mind sure. overnight mm -hmm. and well i'd like to look at the general state of documentary a little bit later on and also some, some of your work but um perhaps yourself you 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 didn't start off as a documentary filmmaker you were actually a, a tv journalist how, how did that change come about and, and what pushed you into making documentary films. Right. Uh, well, that's a long story, but I'll keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I never started filmmaking. I was uh, uh, majored in English when I was in university, but I, I was um, growing up watching a lot of films. I, I guess I enjoy the more or less of a privilege to grow up in a film projectionist school. So right. you can imagine it's kind of like a cinema paradiso in a Chinese version. Uh, but after my graduation, I started to work at the international channel in my city, Wuhan, uh, that's in central China, in the 90s. Uh, and then I was a cameraman there before uh, I had a chance to work with some of my colleagues who are involved in independent documentary filmmaking back in the nine. 1990, um, the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And then I had a chance to move to Beijing to work for CCTV's English channel, also as a cameraman. And that's, uh, that's during the 2000s. I had many chances to travel between the countryside and the cities. Uh, you know, we, we flew to uh, remote areas to mm -hmm. do uh, uh, news reports. Uh, those time really gave me uh, a, a very special angle to look at China from uh, from different perspectives. Uh, you can imagine how, how uh, different of a feeling is that when you spend your morning in a really remote and deserted uh, countryside talking to an old peasant or a young farmer mm -hmm. uh, who tells you about their biggest dream is maybe to just take a look at Tiananmen Square and then you took your flight back you, you finish your news and you took a flight back for two hours you were in Beijing you're, you're being sent home by by a Satan you know just for people who 
live like me or live in the city, things are so taken for granted. And for those who have been left behind in China, it's, uh, it's, it's really a long way for them to, to go into the city and to enjoy the prosperity which had been brought uh, about in, due to the reform and then the opening right. up. Well, your, your first documentary, Last Train Home, dealt with a, a particular segment of, of society, uh, a, a documentary, I should say, which, which t took a host of awards around the world, a good reception. Uh, tell us a little bit about, very briefly, about the background of that film, what, what, what who these people were and what it was about and what you wanted to tell about them. Right. Well, the film had uh, cost us three years and one million dollars to make, but uh, it's a story about one migrant family uh, in which the parents uh, are from countryside and they spent 16 years working in a factory in Guangzhou mm -hmm. making jeans and t-shirts which are sold to the world. Uh, so it's part of a world factory which linked to the globalization and this couple had two uh, children uh, a daughter and a son the daughter is in her adolescence uh, so she, uh, for uh, young people like uh, the daughter uh, who grew up in the countryside and not seen their parents for forever almost they they face two choices uh, when they graduate from high school either they become a farmer and spend the rest of their life in the countryside or they get in university or they just go become a, a, a worker. Um, so our camera followed this family and, and see how, uh, how their life path is about. Uh, this is a very story, a sad story because the parents, they, they almost never spend any time with their children. They mm -hmm. only go back home uh, once a year mm -hmm. uh, during the Chinese spring festival, the Chinese New Year. This is this huge migration of, of, of a hundred and something million people who, who travel back that one time a year for, for two or three weeks at the, at the Chinese Right, New Year. right. So our camera follows the couple in their daily life working in the factory and we follow the young daughter uh, studying in the countryside mm -hmm. and dreaming about the outside world, the glamorous city life. Um, and then when the spring, the Chinese New Year comes, the couple struggles to get tickets and uh, try to get on the train, travel thousands of miles to spend maybe just a week with the daughter. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really an example for millions and millions of family uh, for the migrant workers. Now, a, a question that's always arisen in my mind about when I see a documentary like this is that, uh, well, in, in fact, when I first saw it, I thought it was a film. I didn't realize it was a documentary until I was some way through it. How do you do that? Uh, the girl at one stage confronts her father. They end up having a, a, a fight, and that's the only time she looks at the camera and says, this is me. But uh, do you have to film hundreds of hours to, to, to get that? Exactly, exactly. I mean, the film took us three years to make, and we had over 350 hours of footage uh, in observational style. For, for a 90-minute uh, film? For a 90-minute mm -hmm. film, yeah. So you can really see the ratio. And uh, uh, very interesting when we were screening uh, Last Year Home, the documentary in uh, Western countries. Uh, I remember there was once this, uh, this audience, I think it was in the States, this audience stood up and, and congratulated us that uh, the uh, train station scene, uh, the audience asked, uh, how did you manage your, uh, your extras? How did you manage your, the, your extra actors and actresses yeah. to, to do the, such a thing? So it's, it, was, it was shot very much in a feature film style, I would say, uh, but the observation really are very authentic. I think there's, I was always asked uh, what, what was the secret or, or what was the trick to, to sort of make our subject to ignore or unaware of the camera, but there's really no shortcut for a observational documentary. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's about the time. Hours it's hours. hours and hours of time and, and that you spend. Presumably gaining confidence with Right, right. And, and, and also you need to really open up yourself and, and not hiding anything. And I think most of all, the most important thing is that you really need to respect them as, a, as an essential human being. You know, we, we're all we're the same. We're on the same level. Right. Well, turning to your latest uh, work, as this is a uh, well, let's have a look at the trailer. Just give people. Hello, 
特别不希望他们变成男人。我希望他们一直都男孩下去。Quite a different buzz to that in, in comparison to, to, to the last train. What, what made you decide to follow these young men in a, 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 a talent contest? It was a difficult choice in the first place too, uh, to work on this film. Um, given the fact that I had spent almost a decade you know, looking at the sort of marginal uh, group of people in the Chinese society. Uh, and people were asking why suddenly you choose such a different topic. Uh, but I think it's, a, it's also very meaningful to uh, look at the, the post-90s generation in China. The, the young the young generation who were born in the 90s. This, this uh, is this they, generation, that, as you say, born in the 90s, who people have a very particular uh, feeling about, particular I, I think traits. I think so. I mean, uh, th this are a, a generation who are born to a very fluent uh, time or era uh, mm -hmm. for, for China. And uh, many of them, especially the, the city kids, yeah. um, are born into one child, uh, f one child families. Yeah. And sometimes people think they're very spoiled, they're, they're fragile, they're, uh, they're very self-oriented. Uh, but I, th I think we, w we wanted to really go into their life, their world, to, to look at them from inside out. And this talent contest, the Superboy contest, uh, it had a it had a decade of history, so the, the, contact, the contact itself had a very unusual impact on the Chinese mm -hmm. pop culture history. And its contact was a lot of pressure. I think it's uh, a sort of a, a metaphor for today's Chinese society, which has all, also a lot of pressure that young people has to face, the, the 80s generation and 90s generation. They're, they're all facing a lot of pressure and they have to grow uh, in this pressure, whether they would uh, become very obedient, as many of us had become, mm -hmm. or they could sort of be themselves and th try to think independently and, and, and maybe struggle or fight back a little bit. Because they, they really grow up in a different society. N not just the material affluence, uh, internet and social uh, network had, uh, had gave this generation uh, a lot more, I think, uh, arsenal or room to become different. So I think it's very mm -hmm. interesting to look at them as well. So just like making a documentary film focusing on the migrant workers. Uh, it's like a microcosm for, for the bigger picture of Chinese mm -hmm. contemporary society. In the film, uh, your recent film, I Am Myself, uh, there's also some examination of the relationship between the father and the, and the winner of the competition. Uh, is the family something very important for your films, to examine the, the relationships in families? Exactly, exactly. I, I think family, first of all, it's, it's, it's the basic cell for a society. So by looking at a particular family, I always wanted to reflect a bigger picture through my films. Uh, so in the film I am myself, uh, the, uh, the winner, the, the top winner, uh, he, came, he came from a broken family. Mm -hmm. His father, uh, his family was actually very rich, but his parents divorced when he was very young. So the kids grew up, uh, I think, very isolated and felt somehow abandoned. Uh, and at the final night when he won his uh, champion, I think he was trying to, you know, make even, even make even with 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 his father. That uh, maybe to tell his father that he uh, he was not satisfied with what the family had had gave him yeah. or had treated him for the for all this time. Uh, and the father. The father was there at the final night, and we interviewed. We had a chance to interview the father. He, I, I can see from his face, he has very complicated feeling. I mean, his his kids, his son is already in the final three, and uh, whether he can make it happen on the night, uh, the father was tensed. But more of more of that, I think the father felt somewhat of a bit guilty or, or regretted. Um, he said in the interview, the father said, I divorced, so I didn't really give my son a happy 
childhood, and I never praised him. He wants praise, I knew, but I never did praise him. Tonight, I'm going to praise him once. I mean, that was heartbreaking to hear. Like, who would want to have a father who never praises his son? I know this is a very Chinese tradition that you wanted to. I mean, your parents are some, almost supposed to give more or less of a hardship to your children so that they, they face the challenges of life and then you, you, you expect them to grow up stronger. But not praising your children <laughs> yeah. is a very hard, harsh thing for Indeed. parents to do, but it's very typical in China. Now, you mentioned how pleased you were to get this nationwide um, theatrical release. What are the challenges that face you? This is China. There's suspicion of documentaries, let's face it. What are the challenges? I mean, are they from officialdom? Is it, is it from the theatres? Uh, did you have to make any compromises, for example, to, to, to have this approved? For all the films in China, if you wanted to get a theatrical release, you need to have a permit from SARFT, the, uh, the Film and Television Authority mm -hmm. uh, for the central government. Uh, so yes, for this film, uh, I and myself, we did need to get a permit. Uh, Content-wise, we don't. We, I mean, it's 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 a story sure. about the talent show. So mm -hmm. we don't uh, we don't have a lot of sensitive topics right. or or angles in the film. So we we didn't have much problem with getting a permit for some films that we made before. Uh, we do have to be careful, or we need to be. Uh, selective about how we mm -hmm. present the film to in, in if you want to get a permit how's this seen by I mean other documentary makers here there are sort of a, there's an underground scene here w w would you ever get some sort of criticism for sort of you know selling out going to the mainstream going to the mainstream theaters o obviously yes <laughs> I mean a lot of it <laughs> um, I don't know people didn't come to me and say it in my face but yes uh, I can I can sense there's a lot of uh, uh, question or, or, or wary about m me doing a, a film about a talent show. Sure. Um, there is a very vibrant independent documentary scene in China uh, and I, well, I was one of them and I, I consider myself still one of them. Um, like I said, uh, the topics are different but uh, they um, I think the logic behind it is the same, that we wanted to use documentary to look at contemporary Chinese society, uh, whether it's a migrant family or it's a superboy uh, becoming a, a star. Uh, mm -hmm. They are part of Chinese society, so we wanted to uh, have the variety in, in documentaries. Um, yes, there are questions about me taking up uh, such a film, um, but I, th I think we, we needed that variety. What about funding for these films? Where do you get the funding? Right. Uh, well, this film was co-financed by Hunan TV and uh, our production company. Uh, so it's a very commercial documentary, uh, although the, the content is very independent. Um, but for the films that we used to make, like Last Ring Home, we get fundings from international financiers, mostly uh, public television mm -hmm. and uh, government art funds. Uh, so this is one of the reasons that why I want to make uh, I am myself uh, to have a theater, uh, a commercial release uh, in Chinese cinemas because um, we don't have that that financing system right. to support feature documentaries in China yet. I mean, that we so, have... So it's a struggle for anybody it's, who's it, making it. It's a struggle for everybody. It's a struggle for all the documentary filmmakers in China. The public television um, is not uh, paying a lot of money for, for films. And uh, we have a very strong internet streaming market now, mm -hmm. but mostly for uh, feature films and uh, mini-series. Uh, we have a sizable documentary audience, but they're very scattered. Uh, it's, it's very costly for a, f a documentary film to find its audience. Um, so it's, it's, the system is not quite there yet. You said you got some funding from, from f foreign sources. What about 
big Chinese companies. So Alibaba can't be short of a few dollars. Would, would big Chinese private companies not be in some way want to support this this local documentary scene? For now I have to say that's still a shame that all these big Chinese companies uh, like Alibaba they haven't really well they're starting to put their eyes on documentaries uh, but we're still waiting for them to to you know really uh, wave their hands and then took us in I mean mm. it's a, I understand it's a process. There's nobody to blame. You 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 have to be patient mm -hmm. and see the audience or to see the market growing to a to a size which can uh, commercially support the whole documentary industry or the whole system to run. What would you say to a young filmmaker coming out of college now uh, to persuade him to go into or her to go into the documentary area rather than presumably much more lucrative career in, in commercial feature films? Right. First of all, the days for documentary filmmakers are a hundred times better than 10 years ago. But uh, that's not enough because uh, the young people still have much better choice tomorrow, maybe work in commercials or mm -hmm. feature films. Uh, but I would say. Uh, you know, there's a very famous documentary filmmaker once said, a country does not have documentaries. Uh, it's just like a family does not have a, al a photo album for, for the family. Um, so there is a, I think there's a societal or a historical importance to, to documentaries, especially documentary films that are focusing on contemporary society or contemporary topics. Uh, so that's... Uh, that's really one of the very important values that we documentary filmmakers uphold. So I, I would say to a young filmmaker that if you, if you really have to, if you don't want to regret when you're older and looking back at your youth times, your young ages, mm -hmm. that not regretting that you didn't do anything that, that's a little crazy or a little uh, more uh, idealism, um, then documentary would be a choice. Uh, it's really, it's very much about idealism. What do you feel, what t topic, what issue in China do you feel has not been documented but mm. very much should be? What would you tell this young documentary filmmaker to go out and, and film? Mm. Well, there are definitely so many stories that needs to be documented in China as, as this country is growing or changing so fast. Like when I go back to my hometown in Wuhan, uh, it, it, I get lost every after six months. So there's so many changes and there's so many stories that needs to be told. Uh, but I think uh, in general, a, documentary, a good documentary film always look at people. Uh, real life people, ordinary people, people just like you and me. It's the people who are doing things that are v looking very ordinary but also extraordinary uh, if you look at it from a historical perspective. Um, like I, I would be, I would be interested to f maybe follow a a, a, a young man who is maybe coming from a smaller town and who wants to make it happen in the big city. He may live, you know, one hour drive outside of the main city from Beijing, but he comes to work in the city center uh, and with the expenses so high in the big cities, will the young people make their future, will, will, will they make it in the city or they have to pack up and return to the village, which they don't think themselves belongs to. There, there, there's so many stories like this. People are in jeopardy, or people are in a, in a unique situation, mm -hmm. which would only or could only happen in China, and only in China today. These are the stories. I think young filmmakers needs to go out and really hold up your camera and start documenting. You uh, went to Canada, uh, and and actually are based in Canada at the moment. Uh, would your career have been possible if you had stayed in China? Well, uh, I actually moved back from Canada uh, about three years ago. Um, I mean, Canada is a great place for documentary filmmaking. It has a lot of, uh, it's, it has a very great system for, for male filmmakers, for filmmakers like me. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I seem to have this very close attachment to the people and the stories mm -hmm. here in China. And that's essentially why I, I'm spending so much more time in China than in Canada. 
you're obviously going to be very busy these days as, as uh, I myself goes out, but I guess like all filmmakers, you're thinking of what comes next. Um, right. What that, comes next for you? That's, uh, that's, the big, that's really the big question. I mean, to try to put uh, this film, uh, I myself, on the big screen, uh, actually cost more of my time and my, my energy than making it. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a big project. And what's next for me, um, I wanted to keep making documentaries that are focusing on the current society. Uh, but there's also a lot of uh, colleagues are asking me if I wanted to switch to the feature film side. Uh, that, that could be a, a consideration, but not in the short future. But uh, if you could get your story, your message out about uh, a particular part of society through a feature film, which people will watch for entertainment, would that not be more efficient than spending a long time making a true-to-life documentary? Um, Yes, that may be true, but uh, I think documentary still has its own charm, if mm -hmm. I may say. I think um, I call it the weight of time. Um, it's 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 real, it's authentic, and and uh, I mean the the very length of the time that you put in a film, it, it, it somehow makes it more valuable. At least to me, I I think it makes it more valuable, and it's more. It's more daring. Uh, yes, you have a great point that if we can make a future film and look at the same uh, social topic and has much wider acceptance or influence to, to actually make changes, that would be great too. Um, but documentary still has its own charm. You said there's a, a vibrant uh, documentary uh, scene here. Um, where do you see it going? What's the path? Um, I see it's going to a, a brighter future. Uh, we're making the documentaries on big screens, which we could have never imagined even 10 years back. And with so many state, uh, the, well, with the state broadcaster having a documentary channel and the satellite televisions are launching documentary channels, uh, even in investment capitals are starting to come talk to me if I wanted to make bigger, um, slightly more commercial documentary films. So I see all this and also needless to say the crowdfunding, the social networking and the internet are all giving a lot of imaginary space or possibilities for documentary filmmakers in China. And when the pie is becoming bigger, the market bigger, I think the, uh, the indie scene will also grow uh, together. So I, I, I would hope that more independent documentaries would come out in the, in the years to come. Uh, it's sort of a cliche that China changes so fast and mm -hmm. it is always changing. Will documentary filmmaking change China? Uh, wow, that's a big question. I always, uh, I will always warn people that don't, don't put too much uh, sort of burden on a single film. But on documentary, I, I dare not to use the word change China, uh, but I think it definitely correct to say that documentary films will influence China, especially the young generation. Actually, what's very interesting to see that on my Weibo page, the Chinese Twitter page, a lot of fans are uh, leaving notes that uh, because of this very entertainment, a very entertaining documentary film, they started to know me and they are going back uh, to dig out my previous films, films like Last Train Home, focusing on the migrant worker, and films on like uh, Up the Yanzi about the the uh, three gorgeous uh, migration. So there, the young people are starting to watch these very, uh, if you call it, heavy and very social films. So that's something really inspiring for me. I think that would happen. Uh, that would keep happen in the future. So. Uh, documentary may not change China, but it will definitely influence in a positive way. Finally seen. Thanks very much for coming on with us. Thanks a lot for having me.